Next on our list of applications of the definite integral will be volumes. And we're going to do a couple of sections on volumes, so this is the first one. And the very first thing we'll talk about is volumes by slicing. And in this process, I hope that you will see that the idea of the integral is really very general and that we will be able to apply it in a wide variety of places. Now watch what happens here. Let's recall what we did when we talked about net area because the same ideas are going to be used here in volume and later on in length of arcs. S what we did before is that we had a curve like this, say, some f of x curve going from, say, A to B. And we're interested in the area here, or the net area of parts of the curve are below the axis. And if I just take a typical slice here somewhere in the middle so I can talk about it, remember what we did? We picked an arbitrary point XK star, which led us up to the top, gave us a place where we could draw the top of the rectangle. And then this was the area we figured out step by step. And let's go ahead and walk through that. This gave us a rectangle which looked something like this. And this area has height f of xk star, the actual value of the function at that xk star, and width delta xk, as we learned to call it. And then down here, let's go ahead and follow through our integration argument. The area of this one rectangle is just its height, f of xk star, times its width, delta xk. In fact, let me write those words out. This is the height, and this is the width. And the product of those gives you the area of a single kth rectangle. Then what did we do? In our integration theory, we added all of these guys up as the sum went from k to, from the sum went k equal 1 to n. Then we took the limit as the maximum of the delta xk's, which were the width of these rectangles, remember they are not necessarily equal width. We let that go to zero. And then finally we got net area. And the net area that we got turned out to be, in symbolism, the integral of f of x dx from a to b. So here is the process we developed before. Now we're going to take the same ideas, but instead of cutting up an area by slices and creating rectangles, we will cut up three-dimensional objects and see what sorts of slices we can create there. So that's our next stage now. So first here, let's look at a three-dimensional image drawn partly on the two-dimensional plane. But I think you'll see what we're getting at here. Suppose we have something that looks something like this, some sort of three-dimensional sort of pyramid-shaped figure. And there's the part in the background. And then at this point here, this would be A, and this point here would be where B is. And somewhere in here, we take an arbitrary xk star. And I would draw above that xk star a typical slice at that point, which would look something like this. And we'll talk about this slice. Now, what we've got is a three-dimensional object, a, a volume. And in just instead of breaking this up into slices, which are thin areas, we'll actually break it up into slabs. So there might be a little bit of thickness here corresponding to the interval here from xk minus 1 to xk. And let me redraw this over here and call it something. Let's call this a slab. And that slab is going to look something like this if we set it square, give it a little three-dimensional feel here. It's going to be a slab something like this. Now this slab will have thickness delta xk, because that would be the width down here of the rectangle if we were to draw a rectangle, delta xk. And then this will have some sort of cross-sectional area. And I will label that with big A to stand for area. And so this will have certain area. And then I'll be interested in the volume of this slab. So let's go over here and talk about that. I could then write down the volume of one slab, and that would be the cross-sectional area, A x k star, times the thickness, delta x k. So this would be, let's write that out, cross-sectional area. And this, instead of calling this width, as we did for rectangles, here in this context, let's think of it as thickness 
or if you like depth of this three-dimensional slab. And if you multiply the two together, you will get the volume of this slab. So we have walked up one step from area, which we looked at previously, to volume. But notice that the mathematical form here is exactly the same. It's a function times delta xk. That's the power of the calculus. Now, if we go ahead and run through the process, if we add, take the limit as the maximum of the delta xk's go to zero, we end up getting a volume integral which looks exactly like the previous integrals we've seen. The integral from a to b, that's a to b here, of a of x, this area, cross-sectional area function, and dx. So that becomes this, and that becomes that. And now we have a formula for the volume of this region, and we got it by slicing it up. That's what I meant by saying volume by slicing. So this is the volume form. Now, in memorizing this, you don't want to just memorize the integral from a to b of a of x dx. You want to think of this as cross-sectional area times thickness here. And that will help you get the right form to go under the integral sign. Let's go ahead and look at an example of how we might apply this. We want to find the volume of this pyramid as we will see here. Okay. Well, here's the pyramid. And we can draw it something like this and give us a sense of what it looks like. There's a little bit of the background there and the back part of the pyramid. And what we'll do is we'll imagine the center of the bottom of the pyramid here. And let's take this so it runs through the top of the pyramid like that, little adjustment. And so we have this square base pyramid touching up here. And we'll say that this pyramid has a height of h. So it goes up to a height of h here. And its base, which I will indicate here is a square base, will have side A all the way around. So this will be 0 here. And what we really want to do is come up to an arbitrary level here, some level height Y, and then draw ourselves here a sketch of a slice of that pyramid. And let's take it out of here so we can look at it. And this is going to be a slab. It'll have some thickness. So it'll look like this somehow. And we'll have a little bit of thickness here. And we can mark it so it looks good. And let's imagine that the side is, since it is a square, the side will be the same in both places. And so that means the area, the cross-sectional area, will be s squared. Now the thickness will be delta y. And this is key. When you're doing these problems, as soon as you find out the thickness of the slab, what you've done is you've located the variable. So the variable here is y, which means this will be an integral in terms of y. And also notice that I've stopped writing delta yk. We needed that for our development, but now we can be a little bit abbreviated and just call it delta y. So I'll just make a note here. We're dropping the k subscript. And this tells us the variable is equal to y. OK, so this is what we want to find the volume of, this particular pyramid here. Now, we have s times s and s squared as the cross-sectional area of the slab, but we don't know what s is in terms of y. So what is s is our question. And to get that, we can look back here at the pyramid and take a cut through it, a vertical cut through it. And what we'll have is a set of similar triangles that looks like this. So here is that height y. And so the height of this entire pyramid, and hence of this cross-sectional, is h. This is y, the height up to this point. And that, of course, makes this part h minus y. And then this here is of length 1 half s, because we've cut it down the middle. So it's exactly 1 half one of these sides. And this is likewise 1 half a. And since these are similar triangles, we can get a relationship that we can write down. For example, we could write down that 1 half s is to 1 half a. That's the short side to the longer side here. And then the smaller triangles, h minus y vertical side, to the longer triangles, y side. And h side is what that would be. And then if we solve here for s, We'll have h, uh, s is equal to a, 1 minus 
1 over h y. And that gives us s now in terms of y, because remember, a and h are both constants that are given to us. All right, since we now know s, and we know that the cross-sectional area is s squared, we can square this, and that's really all we needed for the integral of volume. So the volume now becomes the integral where y starts at 0, it's the base of the pyramid, to where y goes to y equals h, which is the top of the pyramid. In here we have that side, a times 1 minus 1 over h, y, quantity squared, dy. This is the side, and when we square it, we have the cross-sectional area we've seen before. In this case, it's actually a of y instead of a of x. And that gives us the correct interval for volume. Now, how do we actually do this interval, integral? Well, if we let u be equal to 1 minus 1 over h dy, that should simplify things considerably. Then du is equal to minus 1 over hy. Let's see, we need to do the limits. So u of h, the upper limit, we put h in here. That's going to be 1 minus 1, that's 0. And u of 0 is going to be equal to 1. So this is substitution, just so you remember. And this, of course, is our translation box. So let's move down here. And let's see what we need to do. We'll have the integral going from 1 to 0 because we replace the limits. Inside, what happens? We get u squared, so there'll be a u squared. The du has a minus 1 over h, however. And remember, we don't have a 1 over h here, or a minus 1 over h. So what we'll do is, we'll imagine that we put it in here, minus 1 over h, and compensate by multiplying out front by minus h. Because minus h times minus 1 over h will be 1. And that won't change the integral. So we have a minus h sitting out front. And one other thing, uh, the u actually only replaced the 1 minus 1 over h y part. What about the a? Well, the a is under here. It's squared, and it's a constant. So the constant can come out front. So this is u squared du. Now, this is a much simpler integral, and we should be able to do this easily. So we'll have minus h a squared u cubed over 3 from 1 to 0. So that means we'll have minus h a squared over 3. And putting 0 in first for u cubed, we get 0 minus 1. So this becomes 1 third h a squared. Now, if you know anything about pyramids, this is exactly the right formula for the volume of such a pyramid. It's 1 third the height times the area of the base. And we have now shown that we could do that using volumes by slicing and calculus. Now we'll continue looking at volumes, and these will be volumes of solids of revolution. And we'll do this two different ways. First, we'll do it by disks. So before we even begin, we need the definition of a solid of revolution. So let's go ahead and define that. A solid of revolution. Now what would that be? Well, what you do is you revolve a plane area, so a piece of area, and you evolve that plane area about a line. And that line will come to be called the axis of revolution. And we'll be spending a lot of time talking about that as time goes on. Revolve a plane area around a line, which we'll call the axis of revolution. Makes sense. And that has to be in the same plane. This, has to be, this line has to be in the same plane as the area is in. And also, it has to be not passing through that area. So in short, we're talking about taking some sort of a region like this and some sort of a line outside it and spinning that region around that line and getting some sort of volume. And that will be called a solid of revolution. Now, let's get more specific on how we're going to find these. The first part we will look at is about disks. And that's what this section was called. Now, imagine, if you will, that we have a rectangle that is sitting so that the axis of revolution crosses right at one edge of the rectangle. So we are revolving this way around that line. So this is a rectangle. We're doing that kind of revolution. So let me mark that this is the axis of revolution here. Because it's very important to make sure you understand where that is in any given figure. Now, what will happen if we actually do the spinning that is indicated here. 
Well, this rectangle will spin around and create a disk. And the disk will look something like this. So here's a disk, and the little rectangle that developed it was, is sitting inside here. And it spins around the axis and creates this three-dimensional disk. So this is a disk. The disk has some dimensions. This is the radius of its cross-sectional face, which of course is a circle. And so that's going to be easy to find the area of. And then it has a thickness determined by the width of the rectangle. So if I want the volume of this disk, it's very easy to figure out. The volume of this disk is going to be the cross-sectional area here, which is pi times the radius squared, because that's how you get the area of a circle, times the thickness, which is this dimension here. So that is the volume of a single disk. Now, do the axes of revolution always have to be horizontal? No. They can be vertical. We might have a situation like this, where we have a rectangle that will then spin this way around this axis. So this is the axis of revolution now. And if we go over here and see what kind of figure we get as a result, we will get a disk that looks like this. It is a horizontal disk. Now, just as drawing lessons, it's always a good idea to put an axis running through the disk to show that it really is a disk formed by revolving. And we'll talk about that a little more later. And one more thing I want to note before we leave here, that both of these rectangles were perpendicular to the axis of revolution. So that's worth noting here. Both of these rectangles were perpendicular to the axis of revolution. And we have the volume of one of these disks. Now, what are we going to do with this, and how will the calculus come into play? Well, we will be applying what's called now the disk method. Seems very sensible, as you'll see. And let's start by drawing a picture that we've seen many times before, some sort of a function like this. And that function goes from, say, some A to some B. Now, we want to spin this region here around the x-axis in this picture. So that will be the same situation we've talked about to form a solid of revolution. But I don't know what kind of volume I'm going to get because the curve up here is not just a straight line. So I want to use calculus to find out what the volume will be. And the way we do it is, of course, we slice this up into various segments of various lengths. And we pick a point down here, xk star, to give us the point where we draw the top of the rectangle. And then we will spin this rectangle. And you see how this is connected to the previous page now. We'll spin this rectangle to get a disk. We'll do that all the way through this region. And then we'll add all the disks up, take a limit, and get an integral, which will give us, we hope, the volume of the solid of revolution. So I need one more dimension to mark here. This would be f of xk star as the height of this rectangle. So if we do the spinning just of the rectangle, we will end up with some sort of a disk that may look something like this. And this disk will have now radius, because that's where the rectangle was that generated this by spinning. The radius of this disk will be f of xk star. And the thickness down here will be delta xk, which was previously the width of the rectangle. So with that, I know the volume of this disk. I know that it is pi f of xk star squared, because that's the area of a circle, which is the cross-sectional area, times the thickness delta xk. Then what do we do? We do what we always do with integration. And I'm not going to write out all the words now. We add these all up, k equal 1 to n. Then we take the limit as the maximum of the delta xk's go to 0. And in the end, we end up with an integral from a to b of pi. This f of xk star just becomes f of x, quantity squared. And this delta xk, of course, becomes the dx. And this, then, will be the formula for the volume that is generated by spinning this region around the x-axis and forming a solid of revolution. So here is a volume formula. But when you think about this, 
you want to really remember how this was derived. This is the only way that calculus will be useful to you, if you understand its derivation. So that this is not just a function squared, this in fact is the radius squared. So now this is the integral of pi radius squared times the thickness. That's the way to think about this. And while I'm here, let me make one note. When I measured radius, radius is always measured in the following way. You go from the axis of revolution, wherever that will be, to the curve. See, that's what I did here. This was the axis of revolution. I measured up to the curve. That's my f of x k star, which is the radius here of this disk. That's how you measure radius, from the axis of revolution to the curve. Now you want to keep that in mind because sometimes the pictures will look more complicated. And you have to remember that the radius is always measured from the axis of revolution, wherever it is, to the curve, wherever it is. Let's look at an example, see how this all comes together. Find the volume formed, and all the volumes we look at here will be solids of revolution, so I won't keep writing that. Find the volume formed when the region, and now I'll describe the region, it's a region under the square, y equals the square root of x curve, and over the x-axis where we go just from 0 to 4. If that region is revolved about the x-axis. And this is how all of these problems will be set up. Some region will be described, which will involve usually a function and some parts of the axes. And it has to be revolved around some line. And the lines that we will revolve around will only be vertical or horizontal. In this case is the x-axis, but it need not be. Solution. Well, in every one of these, I've said this before, you need to draw a sketch. So let's see if we can get a sense of what we're doing here. The curve square root of x is very easy. It just goes up like this. So there's the square root curve. We're going from 0 to 4. So this is the region that we want to spin. And always put a spinning mark, as I do here, around the axis of revolution. That's something you should just take as a tip. And always put that in your picture. So now I have the picture. I know I'm going to spin this around. And when I get done, I'd have some sort of bullet-shaped solid of revolution. Well, let's see. It's always useful to draw the disks. And you notice I'm putting, sometimes I put the uh, thickness on one side and sometimes on the other side. It really doesn't matter as long as you have a reasonable picture. The radius will be from the axis of revolution to the curve, which is just the height of the curve in this case. So that's square root of x. And the thickness, I'll just write delta x. Notice I'm starting to drop the k here, as I've mentioned before. So that means the volume will be equal to the integral from 0 to 4 of pi times the radius squared. The radius is square root of x, so it's square root of x squared dx. And then that immediately simplifies to the integral from 0 to 4 of just pi x dx. I can pull the pi out front. The x will be x squared over 2 from 0 to 4. And finally, I have pi over 2 times 16, that's 4 squared, minus 0. And so finally, I end up with 8 pi. That is the volume in whatever cubic units you're looking at of the solid revolution form by taking this region and spinning it around the x-axis to get that sort of bullet shape. But we did it without using any knowledge of the bullet shape itself. What we did was use the calculus to create these disks add them all up in the form of an integral, and end up with the volume. So the calculus has a lot of power here. Now let's change things up a bit. Let us take a region bounded by the following. y equals square root of x, the same function. y equals 1, which is a horizontal line. x equals 4, which is a vertical line. And let us revolve, revolve this over or about the line y equals 1. So the region is a little different, and we're not revolving around the y or the x-axis. We're revolving around this particular horizontal line. Let's see what we have here. In this picture, we'll need a little more room. So here is my function, the square root function. 
and I'll go ahead and mark it here, square root of x. And then that's only one part of the region. I need to have the line y equal 1, so let's suppose 1 is here. So the line y equal 1 would run this way. Here's the line y equal 1. And then x equal 4 will be some point over here, 4. Now I have a region actually contained, and there it is. That's the region, and now what do I want to spin it around? I want to revolve it around y equal 1. Well, that's different. Here's y equal 1. So I am revolving, put the revolving symbol over here, around this line, y equals 1. It's not the x-axis. So I'm going to have to pay attention to what I'm doing. So if I draw in, and I like to do this very often, a little rectangle to sort of keep things straight, and then draw myself my disk over here. Then let's see, what do I need? I need to have the thickness. Well, the thickness is easy since this is a vertical rectangle. The thickness will be delta x, as it always is. But it's the radius that's most interesting. That's the height of this rectangle. How do I figure that out? Well, the distance from here to the bottom of the rectangle is just 1. That's the y equals 1 curve after all. And the distance to the top of the rectangle is square root of x, because that's the function square root of x, which means that the actual height of the rectangle is square root of x minus 1. So the radius here is actually square root of x minus 1. That's different from what we had before. So the radius will not always just be the function. You actually have to think about it. Remember, we're measuring the radius from the axis of revolution, this line here, up to the curve. So it's this distance here. Well, with all of that in mind, we can now write down the volume integral. It's the integral from where, well, let's see. The variable is x, so I need to know where x begins, which would be here, which I haven't figured out yet, and where x ends, which is 4. So I can put the top limit of integration, but not the lower one. That would involve finding where square root of x intersects the one line. Well, that's so easy, I'll just put it over here. Where does square root of x equal 1? There's only one answer, when x equals 1. So I will be going from, so that gives me a 1 here, and that means my integral will go from 1 to 4. And then I need the cross-sectional area, so I need pi radius squared. The radius is square root of x minus 1 here, not just square root of x, and then the thickness dx. It's always worthwhile to pause at this point and make sure you've actually constructed the correct integral. This is pi radius squared. There's my cross-sectional area times thickness, so yeah, I'm fine. And then I can walk this through. I'll have the integral from 1 to 4, maybe put the pi out front. If I multiply everything inside, I get x minus 2, x to the 1 half plus 1 dx, and so on. I am not going to do all of these integrals. These are just powers of x. You can do this. And you should end up with 7 6 times pi as your final volume. So this was interesting because we were going around a line that wasn't the x-axis, which forced us to create a radius which wasn't just the function. We also had to find intersection point to find one of the limits of integration. So there are lots of features here that were altered, but the basic idea doesn't change. Now a second look at these volumes of solids of revolutions. Let's go ahead and look at the ones done by washers. I'll have to explain what a washer is. Well, let's begin again by looking at rectangles and seeing about how they revolve around lines. In this case, we'll again have a horizontal line, but this time I will have a rectangle that does not touch the line. When we looked at disks, the rectangle did touch the line. And imagine we want to revolve this rectangle around this line, which of course is the axis of revolution again. Let's write that down, axis of revolution. Now, when we do that and we spin this around, maintaining that distance from the line, we will create a figure that is like a disk but has a hole in the middle. These are technically called washers most of the time. And we'll go ahead and do that here. So what we end up with is something that's sometimes called a washer. You draw it looking much like a disk, except that there's a hole in it. And then you can see the axis emerging like so. So these are called washers. So this is a washer. And in the washer, there are dimensions to keep track of. There is a thickness dimension down here, as always, which will be the width of the rectangle, whatever that is. But now, because there's a hole, we have two radii. 
we have a large radius which goes from the center to the very edge. That's the large radius. And then there's a radius that goes from the center only to the edge of the hole. And that will be a small radius. And then the cross-sectional area of a washer is just a big circle minus a small circle. So that ring, that annulus, is just the large circle minus the small circle in area. So that means I can write down the volume here and say that the volume is equal to the area of the large circle, which is pi times the large radius squared minus pi times the small radius squared. That's the cross-sectional area, and then I multiply that times the thickness. I'll just write thick there. That's the thickness. So this is the volume of this washer. It's almost the same as the volume of a disk, except that here we have the difference of two circles instead of just a single circle. Also, we can take this vertically and have a rectangle oriented in this way, spinning around the axis like so. This is the axis of revolution again. And in this case, we will get a washer again, but it is a horizontal washer. Maybe something that looks like this, with its hole in the middle. And there we have it. Notice that in both of these cases, as we saw for disks, we are still drawing rectangles that are perpendicular to the axis of revolution. When you do that, you will get either a disk or a washer, depending on circumstances. So now let's go ahead and apply this to curves so we can start looking for volumes. So this is the so-called washer method. Again, we'll start off with the picture of some functions here. Let's suppose we have a function like so, maybe, and another one like this. The first one, the upper one, we'll call f of x. The lower one, we can call g of x. And maybe they go from a here to b here. And we want to spin the region between here around the x-axis in this picture. So as before, I'll go ahead and draw a typical rectangle, like this one here, which is going to be located at xk star, which gives it the the place where we cut it at the f and the g graphs. And then it will have a distance to its bottom and then a distance to its top. And those will be, I'll write those over here for clarity, those will be determined by the two functions. So here we will have a washer, like so. There's a hole there. Run the axis through it, all right. The large radius here is the distance from the axis of revolution here up to the curve f. So that will be f of xk star. The small radius, on the other hand, is the radius from the axis of revolution up to the curve g, just that distance. So that will be g of xk star. So we have the small and the large radius, and now I can write down, using this notation, the actual volume, and I'll just write out the volume here for that one washer. So it's going to be pi of xk star squared, pi times f of xk star squared, because that's the radius, minus pi g of xk star squared, whoops, the square needs to be on the outside there. So it's the pi f of xk star squared time minus pi g of xk star squared times delta xk. So there are the large brackets on the outside. And this part in here, remember, is the cross-sectional area of the washer, which is a ring. And then we do what we always do in developing the integral. We add these all up, from k equals 1 to n. Then we take the limit as the maximum of the delta xk's go to 0, and we end up with an integral. The integral will look like this. The integral from a to b, that's where the region starts and the region ends, of pi, which is common to both of these, so I can factor it out front. And then what's left? f of x 
squared minus g of x squared times dx. And this will be the volume that we were looking for in the case that we have a situation of a region between two curves, as we have here. And we want to spin it around an axis and so form washers and end up with this volume. Now, there is one thing you need to note algebraically here that there's a very common mistake that's made. So I'll just write careful. What you need here is f of x squared minus g of x squared. So it's the square of the one function minus the square of the other function. It is not the same thing as f of x minus g of x quantity squared. Those are different algebraically and different geometrically. So be careful when you do this. And let me mention my note once again because it's good to remind you. Both of the radii in this case, there was one, the small, and one that was large. Both radii were measured from the axis of revolution, which is the x-axis in this case, to the curves. So keep in mind that radius for either one, either the small or the large radius, must always be measured from the axis of revolution up to the curve. Axis of revolution up to the curve. That's how you get the correct radii to create this kind of a volume formula. All right, let's do an example to see how this works. So here's the region we want to spin. It'll be the region between y equals x squared plus 1 and y equals x minus x plus 3. And it will be revolved about the x-axis. So that is the simplest possible case for us, so we can practice this. Solution, again, my recommendation always is sketch. You really can't do these problems without a good sketch. So let's see what we have here. Let's draw a picture that looks something like this. The 45 degree line is what minus x is going in the reverse direction, and then 3 pushes it up by 3. So let me go ahead and draw that. And that will be my minus x plus 3 line. So that will be crossing up here at 3. And then I can mark off these two because I need to get to 1. Because x squared plus 1 is the parabola, the upwards parabola, crossing through at 1. So that will be something like this, crossing here at 1. And so here's the region we're talking about. And we want to revolve it around the x-axis. So we're set. We just need to find out, first of all, the intersection points here to find out where the region begins and where the region ends. And then we want to write the integrals. So I will draw a typical rectangle here, always a good idea, to remind yourself of what you're doing. And then I will need the small radius, which goes from the axis of revolution up to the first curve it encounters. And then the larger radius, which goes from the axis of revolution up to the second curve that's encountered. And I think I have what I need here. This lower curve, of course, is x squared plus 1. And let's go ahead and draw the washer in here just so we can keep track of what we're doing. So we have a washer. It's going to look something like this. And the large radius was the one from the bottom up to the top curve, which is minus x plus 3. That's the large one. The small one is from the bottom up to this curve, which is x squared plus 1. And the thickness, of course, is delta x. And I'll put a check mark here to indicate that the variable of the integral will be x. That's a good way to remind yourself. Now, I need these two intersection points before I go any further. So let's go ahead and do that calculation. So the intersection points. Well, I set the two curves equal to one another. x squared plus 1 equals a minus x plus 3. Bring everything over to the left. And then I see that this factors nicely. x plus 2, x minus 1 equals 0. So that means x is equal to minus 2 or x is equal to 1. And it's clear from the picture that this will be minus 2 then and this will be 1. So with that, I have the setup I need for writing down the volume integral. The volume then 
is equal to the integral from minus 2 to 1, those two limits we just discovered, pi, and then in here we need the large radius minus x plus 3 squared minus the small radius x squared plus 1 squared dx. Now, these are just powers of x. If you multiply them all out, it's very easy to do this integral. I leave that to you. And you should end up with 117 over 5 pi as the volume in this case. So working with washers can be a lot of fun, as long as you draw the picture carefully and make sure that the integral you set up is the correct one. The rest of it is usually just integration techniques you already know. The setup is really what matters here. Time for some practice on some exercises. First exercise. Let's go ahead and find a volume. Find the volume, and I'll write it out this time, the find the volume of the solid of revolution generated from the following region. And the region is the region bounded by these curves, y equal 1 over x, y equal minus 1, which is a horizontal line, x equals 1, which is a vertical line, and x equals 2, which is another vertical line, revolved about the line y equals minus 1. Give that one a try. First, we'll draw a sketch. Always the right way to begin. So, let's see what we have here. We have, first of all, the y equals 1 over x curve, which looks something like that. So this is y equals 1 over x. We are going between 1 and 2 on the x-axis. There's 1 and 2. And down here is this y equal minus 1 line, which is where the region ends. So I need to go all the way down here and shade that in so I see the region correctly. This is the y equals minus 1 line. That also happens to be the line we're spinning around. So if we draw a typical rectangle just to orient ourselves, just put that rectangle in here, you see that it touches the axis of revolution. And so this is going to be a problem using disks. So I'll need to have all my various dimensions clear, which means I need to know the height of the rectangle because in the disk, as you recall, in a disk, the height of the rectangle becomes the radius of the disk. So, what is the height here? Well, this part here from minus 1 below the x-axis up to the x-axis is a height of 1. And then the upper part from the x-axis up to where the curve is, is just the curve itself, 1 over x. Which means the radius here is going to be 1 over x plus 1. It's this distance plus this one to give the entire radius for this disk, which is the height of this rectangle. So you have to pay attention to your pictures to get the radius right. It's not just 1 over x. In this case, it's 1 over x plus 1. The thickness, of course, is still delta x. This is a problem about disks, so it's good to mention that. And now we're ready to write down the volume formula. The volume, then, is the integral from 1 to 2. We're told that we start at 1 and end at 2. Pi times the radius squared which is 1 over x plus 1 squared. And why is that? Because this is the cross-sectional area of a disk, which is a circle. And then dx. And then we can walk this through. We can pull the pi out front. Multiplying this out, we get the integral from 1 to 2. x to the minus 2 plus 2x to the minus 1 plus 1 dx. I'm using the minus powers because it's easier to do integrals if we have them written that way. Then I can go ahead and integrate this. This is the integral. This is pi times, let's see, x to the minus 2 will give me minus x to the minus 1 as its antiderivative, plus 2. And the antiderivative of x to the minus 1, which is 1 over x, is, you may recall, the natural log of the absolute value of x. And then finally, plus x going from 1 to 2. So it's nice to see the absolute value and nice to see the natural log turning up in a problem. Let's continue this. So the volume continued will be equal to pi. And then I go ahead and put the two numbers in that I saw before, the 1 and the 2. 
First I put the 2 in, minus 1 half plus 2 log 2 plus 2, minus, and then putting the 1 in, I get minus 1 plus 2 log 1 plus 1. Well, look what happens with this second part. Log of 1, of course, is 0. What's left, minus 1 and 1, that also adds to 0, so the second term just drops out. And in this first one, I can clean this up a little bit and maybe get pi times 3 halves plus 2 log 2. And that's as good a stopping place as any. Unless you want to approximate this with a calculator, that's a perfectly good answer. So the volume here was a matter of using disks, but making sure that you paid attention to get the right radius. Let's look at another example, a problem for you to try. Again, it's the same sort of thing. Find the volume of the solid of revolution generated from, and I will give you the region now, generated from the region bounded by y equals the square root of x, which we've seen before, y equals 0, which is the x-axis, and the vertical line x equals 9, and this will be revolved about y equals 3, a horizontal line instead of the x-axis. Try that one. Again, we begin with a sketch. And in this case, let's see, one of our curves is the square root of x curve, so we know that one. Let's draw that in here. And I'll mark it over here as the square root of x curve. And then let's see, x equals 9 is the stopping place on the x-axis, so we're going from 0 to 9. And then y equals 0 is the x-axis. I'll mark it in, but it's the x-axis. And so this is our region in here that we are interested in spinning. We want to spin it around the line y equals 3. Well, where's that going to be? Well, notice that this is the square root of x curve, and this is 9. The square root of 9 is 3, so that means we're talking about just where this hits at the top here. So this is y equals 3, and we're spinning around the y equals 3 line. So there's 3. That's a little different from what we've done before. So this region needs to be spun. So if I draw a typical rectangle in here like this, I need to spin this rectangle around this axis of revolution. And notice that it doesn't touch most of the time. So we're dealing with a washer situation, which means I need to know two radii. I need to know from the axis of revolution to the edge of the curve. So that's from up here to where this region ends in this case. That distance, well, that's easy. That's just a distance of 3. And then I need to know this little distance in here from where the curve goes, where the curve ends, the square root of x curve, and the 3 it begins. Well, the height up to there is 3. The height up to the curve is square root of x. So this little region here is going to be 3 minus the square root of x. So we already have a couple of small complications here. As I said, we're going to be looking at washers. And so a washer looks something like this. And there we are with that, running this through here. And so the large radius we've discovered is 3. And we know that the small radius is 3 minus the square root of x. The thickness is, as usual, delta x, which is the variable of this volume integral we're about to get to. So the volume now is the integral from 0 to 9 from here to here, of pi, and I need the large radius squared minus the small radius squared dx for thickness. So this is the cross-sectional area. If you want to work this out, you can. It's just powers of x again and constants, so I will leave it to you. You should end up with 135 over 2 pi as the volume here. So I hope that's what you actually got, because this is a nice problem for setting up.